Hello, everyone. So today I am joined by Raul, one of the co-founders of Instantly.ai. They've had some crazy success over the last one to two years, which I'm buzzing to, to dig into. Um, so Raul, give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do, and then we'll, we'll take it from there. Yeah, nice to be here, man. Uh, thanks for the invite. So just quickly, maybe I've done online marketing for 10 plus years, had a couple of agencies, a couple of failed startups. And then two years ago, we created Instantly for our own agency to have a tool that we can actually use because all the other tools got too expensive. So we created something, came to the market with completely new pricing, built it for ourselves, which is why people and agencies are loving it. Uh, we have four co-founders and now we built a team of almost 30 people. Uh, yeah, growing fast, building fun stuff in the lead generation data sales automation game. And yeah, now I'm here, man. Nice, nice. Okay, cool. Good summary. So let's like rewind um, because you said some interesting stuff there. You've got 10 years in marketing, uh, multiple agencies, failed businesses, stuff like that. So let, let's take it back to the very beginning. Like how did your journey start in the business world? Like what was that first side hustle or venture that I guess whetted your appetite? So I think I have like uh, two different ones. So I went, I'm from Estonia and I went to university in Denmark where I studied marketing and design and programming. I found out really fast. I'm like shit at design, shit at programming. So I went on the marketing route. And it, it, when I was in uh, university, I started like so many side projects, but it was just like some like, small, tiny, cool ideas, some blogs. My first like big uh, project, if you can name it that, that made money was actually a Facebook page uh, in Estonia about a famous politician, uh, a little bit like a meme page. And it got really popular. It got 50,000 uh, users, like page likes. And Estonia only had like 300,000 uh, Facebook users at the time. So like everybody knew about this page. They were talking about this on the radio and companies started reaching out, asking to like a post there. So you can see like my road started as an influencer. I got paid to post about wow. <laughs> it was like random stuff, man. It was like restaurants offering their services and then some like charity stuff. That was like where I made my, my first money online. And then I got the, the bug for online stuff and I tried to build a more like service side business, like a legit agency. And my first agency or like my first actual client came from a website design agency. And I reached out to companies with very shitty websites and said like, hey, I already built you a new website, which I didn't actually have, but it was like just like an angle. And when they responded, I just quickly got a WordPress template, copied their website text over it and said, like, hey, you want this? Like 500 bucks. And that's how I got my first uh, agency client and yeah, did that little bit, wow. but I pivoted into SEO pretty quickly. And I was like, I did a few years like okay. SEO agency stuff. Oh, wow. I didn't know any of this. And so how was you reaching out to these WordPress clients? Is it like cold, like just manual cold email or? Manual cold email. I went to, wow. there's a page like, uh, I don't remember, like if you remember, like before your time, there was like phone books and stuff. It's like an online yeah. phone book in Estonia where you can see like companies. Mm -hmm. So it went through website and there's like contact one by one. Yeah. But yeah, like now that yeah. you mentioned, it was cold email. Yeah. In the UK, we call it, well, I don't know, they're still around. Yellow Pages is this yeah, big yeah. book. Like if you wanted to order a takeaway, if you wanted to call a business, you would like go to the letter in the yellow, like this big book. I remember that. Wow, that's old school. It just shows you like, how good we have it now like how privileged we are we could just literally go to a website and download data of like our entire icp people used to go through uh, a book and have to call people okay that's interesting um okay so seo agency um i didn't know that that's that's surprised me so that's why you guys are pumping out so much content on that side um what happened after the seo agency so i I started working together with one of the biggest agencies in Estonia and they had, they were like this like old school, uh, just like ad agency, just doing like physical ads, posters and stuff. They didn't have 
uh, into the marketing section. So I came in and I was like their go-to guy for like SEO, everything like online marketing grade, Facebook ads. So just like helped them a lot. I came in at right, right time. It was pretty new. I remember we had to like pitch the biggest beer factory in Estonia that they need a Facebook page. And they said like, no. Uh, it was like that time where people like businesses didn't know like how useful it actually was. And I did like, yeah. just, like pretty much everything that you can think of in the online world. But the SEO stuff was the simplest. I built my agency for around like, for that time, it for me, it was like a lot of money, like 5K a month. And I was just mm-hmm. like chilling. I got super lazy, man. I stopped doing outreach. I just had like some big clients that brought in money every month. I stayed at home, just chilled, did a little bit of work. And then at some point, like customers start dropping off and off and I had to find like something new. And then I started dabbling with uh, some like startups, trying to build some like apps, a little bit different kind of uh, niche went after that world. Wow, wow, wow. Interesting. The good thing about SEO, I think, I, I don't know, maybe you'll disagree with me here, but like if you're getting started in the agency world, SEO seems the way to go because your customer lifetime value must be insane, right? Because for yeah. SEO, it takes so long to, to start seeing results. And so these clients have to stay with you to, to start seeing those results. So LTV must be like six, 12, 18, 24 months. And I always, I always thought about that because like a lot of, well, every SaaS company who's um, serious about growth does SEO and it must be like, it must be such a good agency to start. Um, okay. Wow. You've done a lot. Um, so I had, I had a look at your, your background. Don't worry, I didn't do anything too deep, but I noticed you worked at a company called, um, salesprocess.io. Now, if you're in the internet money space, um, you're probably familiar with sales process. It's, uh, Nick Cosman's one of his old companies, right? Talk me through that period. What, you know, why did you get into that? How was that? And, you know, how did that impact your sort of trajectory? So I think that was like one of my like lowest points before I went there. I didn't have like almost any money. I was like struggling, like thinking about what I can do. Like I had all these experiences, all these connections, like everything. Like I could have started like a regular agency. I could have like started another like a side project, but I wanted to try something new. And I randomly saw his... uh Nick Cosmins, who's like an OG genius, like everything that we built, like is like mostly around that, that he like taught us. And I saw the ad and it was like, make 20K as a remote salesperson. And I was like, no, like this can't be real. So I went on the webinar, jumped on there, checked, he showed the numbers, showed the pitch deck, showed that like people are actually making this money. And it was like a sales sales type of webinar was like on board the team and i was like yeah fuck it like let's give it a go and then i started there started learning everything went super hard added a apartment of new york as my phone wallpaper to motivate me and i was like sending like manually like every day hundreds of emails again we used to close there and just manually doing the outreach and that was like where we started to get the the seed idea for mm-hmm. instantly because you had to do it mm-hmm. manually there wasn't a tool that allowed you to do add multiple email accounts to one campaign, just like one account, one email, and you just do it manually mm-hmm. one by one by one. But doing that taught us a lot, like how it works from reaching out, finding clients. One of my biggest uh, successes there was I didn't go after the list that everybody else was using. I found a different one, which like is crunch base. Like most people like know it mm-hmm. now, but nobody was using it. So I had this like gold mine. And I booked like 80 something demos my first uh, month there and got really good at just like booking demos and also on the sales uh, sales side, combining it like this Canadian US style selling with the calmer European, more consultancy type selling and yeah, just helping people build their businesses, which was like the offer. So pretty like mm-hmm. good offer, like simple, actually helping them make money. It actually mm-hmm. works if people put in the work and just like learned from sending emails to sales, getting them in, but most important, like how to do the sales calls, how to process them. Mm-hmm. It's like so crazy. Like to this day, I just jumped on uh, another a sales call, some like dude trying to sell me something. Just like told Nils, another co-founder, and instantly, like how bad the sales processes are for people. Like I still have it made, like it is, like the structure and everything is missing for so many people that we learned 
from sales process and we incorporated after our agency sales feed after sales process so that was like how we could start with our agency to get generate leads everything we learned from the sales process and then combining it with our own stuff that turned into instantly so it was like amazing amazing experience like learned so much such a valuable skill and like everybody online should learn sales like if you're just doing cold emails like you can find a partner that does sales but if you go through it you understand the process it's going to make your life so much easier and like it's almost impossible not to succeed you just have to put in the numbers reach out to enough people do enough sales calls you can't fail like literally can't fail if you have a good offer wow yeah i think i think it's so important getting people on the call is one thing right it's actually like getting them to buy in on the philosophy and you know um getting them across the line especially as if you're selling like agency services that there's a bit on the the higher ticket side um you know you, you need those sales skills okay you you use the word the words we and us a lot there when you were speaking did you meet your co-founders during this period or yeah, so it's uh it's a mix uh for example my oldest a friend co-founder who is Rayo in instantly i met him he was the classmate of my ex-girlfriend and like the only good thing that came out of that relationship was like Rayo and like the bond we had and before instantly we did like a bunch of other stuff with Rayo like we started a online store we tried the shopify the drop shipping stuff the print on demand stuff so we built a lot of different stuff and then like instantly was the final one then the developer uh, I found on Reddit, <laughs> there was like a phase I posted a lot on like indie hackers and Reddit to yeah. find co-founders. Again, I didn't have a project, I was just reaching out with my marketing background and looking for developers, somebody that can work on something. And we actually started a different company, working a different company before instantly. Uh, it was to find cheap travel tickets, travel uh, like flights, but it was exactly right before COVID. COVID hit, like it's like mm -hmm. done. And then he reached out after like two years, randomly on Messenger, like, hey, I have this new project. And his project was, he wanted to create similar to like Jasper AI, that was like AI copywriter. And we tried mm -hmm. it, we tried to pitch it, most people didn't want it. And then we turned it into a cold email tool because that was what we needed in that moment. And then Niels, I met at the sales process, we're both salespeople there. And like same stuff, we had a bond. We did like daily calls with Nils. We did script wars, like daily practicing every day, how to handle objections, how to get better at sales. Uh, and then after that, we met Nils in Mexico, just randomly went there with friends. He was there again, got the, like Mexican bond, started another agency together, and then which turned into instantly and then. Wow. Wow. There's a lot of history there then. Cause like, um, how I discovered you guys was I think you were just like posting on Twitter and people were talking in these like communities, like, Hey, there's this new tool doing this deal. And like from an outside perspective, and I know this is very like naive, but it kind of seems like, I don't know, this product just came out of nowhere. And like, you had this crazy journey, but like to get to that start point, you guys have done so much, like you failed so many businesses, you've tried so much. Um, I think it just highlights like the kind of journey you have to go through to, to get that, like to get that win, you have to take so many losses. Um, yeah. I find the the sales process sales process story really interesting as well. I might have to talk with you more about that um, offline. But so you mainly you um, you operated, you owned like agencies. I guess why why did you have this desire to go to like software to SaaS? Was there like a was there something you noticed? Was maybe somebody told you to go down that path like why did you go off to SaaS? Uh, i think it's just like good timing uh, i had run, done software before but like software isn't easy uh, people underestimate like how hard it is to build the software and, like to this day like we have one of the best developers and like still bugs come up and stuff you have to like build this stuff so i wasn't really into like we need to build like software around it but as our agency grew it was just like uh, obvious like spot in the market, everybody was charging per email account. So we were buying for our leads agency, Google accounts per account. And then we're using like different tools for warm up per account plus sending per account. So our costs just like flu. And then yeah. I told you 
Sumit, our developer, like reached out mm -hmm. and talked. He's wor working about working on some new project. It was just the perfect time. Like we need right now, like outreach tool. Let's figure this stuff out. And when we started talking, we went into also like the warm up. There are some warm up mm -hmm. APIs out there, but the developer checked into it, the cost, and it turned out it's actually uh, like on the database side, relatively cheap to build it. And all the other people were just like overcharging. And that was like one of the big things that we came into the market with this unlimited warm up. You can connect as many accounts as you want, which made it successful. But it all started, it came from our own need for agency. We built the tool for ourselves. We use it every day. Mm -hmm. That's why we had to make sure it works. It's great and actually helps you get results. So we took away like all the fluff, everything that a lot of tools have that are not tied to their North Star, like getting results and just mm -hmm. super simple, clean, get results as fast as possible. And that's mm. just building software for ourselves was the main reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I like it. Um, I think most success stories come out of somebody like scratching their own itch and then they realize that there are a lot more people out there who want to scratch that itch. And so like a, a business is born. Um, so you've seen like both sides of the fence, right? You've seen like service-based businesses, you've worked at them, you've owned agencies. Um, and now, of course, you're a SaaS founder. Um, you know, instantly growth aside, because clearly it's going very well. But, you know, what do you prefer, like being in SaaS or like agency owner? Because they're very kind of different, um, you know, service-based businesses, very one-on-one -on -one with your clients, a lot of human interaction, whereas SaaS, slightly different, more leverage. What are your thoughts on that? So I think it's, it changes, it's, it's a spectrum and I couldn't have done one without the other, but mm -hmm. now when it's going well, like SaaS is easier, better, more scalable, uh, like the leverage of code is insane and there's no, not many like one-on-one -on -one touch points as a service business, but I wouldn't start out with software, like even just, I have no experience with service business. I have no experience marketing, creating software from scratch, very hard, very difficult. We locked out with our developer, with the marketing, with the niche. It's I think rare case, but now that I know more about SaaS, I would say like we closed our agency a few months after we launched instantly because it was going so well, because we have the same problems as every agency we had. Uh, like dickhead clients, just like stress, uh, all of this, like bad talks, client doing one-on-one -on -one calls, very time consuming. The money was like great at the time, like needed it, but the real big money is in software. So I think software is more of the end game, but starting out, I would still, uh, I would still start with a service business. Yeah, I know. I think, I think a common mistake people make when they try go straight into software is what what's the point of software right well it's to like automate things and i think what people do when they try to go straight into software is they try to automate things that don't really need to be automated and so they just create these random tools that don't solve a big problem whereas if you start doing things manually well then you understand the challenges of doing that manually you you understand like what problems you're solving and then you build the software to solve those problems and so you're just solving a bigger problem which means you're going to find like product market fit um, a bit easier. Um, how, so when you started instantly, obviously you guys were just using it mainly as like an internal tool. How, how did you initially start to like, you know, spread the word, um, start getting those like first users? So it was, again, I think rare, but we combine it with our agency offer. While we're doing agency calls, we showed them instantly. We have our own tool. This is what we're going to be using for you. Uh, and the first agency clients were the first instant users. We didn't do any <laughs> other outreach or marketing before we launched an AppSumo, which was the big launch, but it wasn't publicly open. It was just us doing outreach for our agency clients. Nice. And was that like, did you have like two split offers? Did you have like a done for you? So you you use instantly for them and then like a done with you where it's like, well, you can log in and use instantly, but we'll like, you know, get you your leads and stuff like that. Did you have like a similar setup to that or? In the beginning, it was only done for you. We, we did everything for them. We just like showed them we're going to use this 
but we mentioned it on a call that let's say uh, you want to do it on your own we can just hand everything over you can just log in take over that's the same thing we did once we decided to close down the agency they had mm -hmm. their separate instant accounts we just hand them over you can, uh, we recommended different partners that can use it so i think some people actually went that route but in the beginning it was most like service because you know like people are lazy they don't want to do okay. stuff so we just told them we're going to do it but we can hand it over nice that's a good downsell create your own software business so you can downsell people to interest and i like that it's like a it's a it's an interesting funnel um okay and you you briefly mentioned it there app um for those like who, who aren't aware like what happened there talk through that process like um why why did you decide to go for it and like i guess how much of an impact did that have on like the instant e story so I wouldn't do AppSumo launch ever again. I wouldn't recommend it for everybody, but it was amazing for us. Like that's the main reason why we got so successful and made a splash because we had a very unique launch strategy. You shouldn't do AppSumo in hopes of creating sustainable MRR. Like it's lifetime deals to just pay once and it's there forever. You shouldn't do it to get revenue. But what we did it for was to fill our warm up pool. So if people don't know to do call limit warm up, you need a lot of people communicating between each other. And one option is to buy just tons of old accounts. We didn't want to do it. We want only real human accounts. So we launched an app mm -hmm. straight away, got like thousands, tens of thousands of email accounts into our warm up pool. It's a similar like chicken and egg problem that Tinder had in the beginning. Like the app idea is so good, but if you go on and there's nothing there, it doesn't work. So you need to feel it in the beginning. And that's what we used app for. And the funny thing is we were, uh, like debating in our team, like how to do it exactly. Should we do it? There's, it wasn't like an easy decision, but mm -hmm. a couple of days before the launch in AppSumo, there's a, like a review section or the reviewer tool, uh, out of five, uh, stars to see like how good it is. And we got like two stars. It's so, like, yeah, it's like hit or miss can't, can't be like that good. And then we turned out to be one of the highest grossing, like one of the best launches, like really good reviews. But we went also very hard. A lot of people abandon it once they jump on AppSumo when they get launched. All of our founders, we were in Barcelona then. We ordered like six pizzas and just like <laughs> throughout the night when it like the gates opened, we were there doing support. We didn't have a support team. We weren't prepared at all. We were doing it live. It's like sleeping a couple of hours, waking up, doing it again. And we were very responsive on the AppSumo page and on Intercom to helping our users, which turned out to be one of the keys. Uh, because why it was so successful. And after that, the very important thing we did was we were very strict with uh, AppSumo users. Like after it was over, our initial deal, I think was for two months. We shortened it for like, I don't know, six weeks or something because we just want to go into MRR already. We didn't want to give lifetime deals more. And we ended and was very strict. Like there's like no more. We're not going to launch an AppSumo no more. We're not going to do Black Friday deals. After that, we're going to go straight into MRR. And that's what all sorts of companies should be doing. AppSumo is just as like launching board, but your main goal is to find MRR, which AppSumo just helps you do from like branding wise, marketing wise, mm -hmm. getting the word out there. But other than that, it's uh, it's very difficult. So everybody out there that is thinking about it, be very careful. It's it's not as easy, easy as it sounds. Interesting. Okay, cool. Gonna unpack that. But yeah, I, I like, I think... So I think apps have been launching on AppSumo for a while, but I've definitely in the last year seen like a, a rise in what I what I could only describe as what seems like as pump and dumps. You know, like crypto where people would launch these coins and there'd be so much hype and then boom, they just poof, like disappear. I feel like a lot of that has been happening with SaaS products recently on AppSumo. Like, um, you know, there'll, someone will spin up like a LinkedIn outreach tool or like a data, you know, there'll, it'll be like a, a database or something and they'll just launch it and, you know, and then nothing will happen. So it, it also from the consumer side, it, it seems like you need to um, like be careful. But so with your launch, how many users did you have before you launched an AppSumo? Realistic was like 10 or something, a little bit, maybe more wow. that we had on the agency side, but like no users were using it just for themselves. Our original launch was just on AppSumo, but yeah, our developer is insane. We prepared for the database and everything to be scalable. 
to handle the volume. But obviously, still, there's always going to be hiccups, some bugs, something not working, and just have to go through them and have uh, developers online to fix them. But yeah, we weren't very prepared or didn't have a lot of stress testing before the launch. Mm. How many how many users did you get from AppSumo? Are we like talking? I mean, it, it sounds like it's in the thousands. Or are we talking like tens of thousands? Like how how many users are we talking? No, I don't think it was ten thousand. I think it was between three and four thousand. But wow. what made it like harder for us because we allowed like unlimited accounts, so that you can multiply it by many for email accounts for warm up and sending. Wow. Okay, and that this all happened in the space of like two months from from probably yeah. having a handful of users on your product to probably get into the stage where I feel like the average product led SaaS company it takes one, two, three, four years to get you know to the to the size of thousands of customers, and you guys did it in like two months. That's that's pretty crazy. Um, okay, and so let's kind of fast forward a bit to. The present so like how's how's growth going for you at the moment you don't have to share numbers but just like generally speaking um like since the app sumo launch how, how are things going yeah so growing really well steadily uh, seo is a big part we're doing a lot of content our focus is a lot of organic social youtube just evergreen content now we launched ads as well we haven't done much or any ppc at all so going seeing if you can make that channel work as well but it's mostly Mostly still organic, just the word of mouth and uh, good product, good reviews, people recommending mm. it. Even AppSumo users are upgrading. So there's like so many different avenues where the growth is coming from, but most of it is mm. still like organic. If I watch SEO, our main keywords, it's all branded. If you like Google mm. instantly, I think we're before the dictionary word instantly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. That's that's from all your um your SEO agency years, you know, putting that to work. <laughs> yeah. Man. Okay. So you guys are gonna. I I feel like um, and I'm not I'm not gonna share the number. I feel like you guys are gonna hit a big mil milestone this year in terms of like um revenue, and that's you know you've you've basically gone from zero to this crazy milestone in in less than two years. Um, if do, if you could like pinpoint it to sort of like three or four things that have really really like contributed to that success like what what would those be you, you probably briefly just touched on it there but okay so it's a really good question i would say one of the biggest parts is having an offer software service whatever that's if it's b2b directly correlated to business growth if you help businesses grow it's going to make all of your sales efforts much easier because you're hitting on their priorities. That's what Instant does. It just helps you make more revenue. We use Instantly to grow instantly because it's so good at generating revenue. So that's the biggest part. Uh, second part is building it for ourselves. If you have to use it every day yourself, you're going to make sure that it works, that it's good. Uh, and then mm -hmm. putting a lot of effort into customer support. And I don't mean only like listening what people want. In reality, most of the new features that we're building came from us, not from users. A lot of people say like, listen to users, obviously you should do that. But users vary so much, they want different things. We've always had very clear North Star what we want to do. Again, connecting to the first point, helping people make more revenue. That's how we build features. We still haven't uh, built uh, a feature that people have been asking us from day one, how can I add signatures? We don't have a signature. We're the only tool that doesn't have a signature feature because we realistically don't see it impacting uh, growth as much as a lot of features that we can build. So mm -hmm. having that growth build mindset or the focus, building all of your features around that. And then we've been going fucking crazy on the marketing, bro. Like like we've like all the founders still to this day, we do weekly YouTube videos. We do podcasts like you're doing. We're doing... Uh, content we launched a facebook group there's over eighteen thousand mm -hmm. members there mm -hmm. we, we're doing lives almost weekly there uh, we post stuff like if it's on youtube it's there forever so it's like getting higher and higher all the time uh, then seo we started early then yeah, we have partners affiliates our own outreach because we have a tool we can just send out emails so we're, a lot of that growth is thanks to all these things we're doing uh short form clips we started doing uh, what else we're doing 
emails, email flows, the like intercom flows that like you helped us set up, like mm -hmm. these kind of things. Mm -hmm. If you look at it, yeah, the growth is amazing, everything, but we've like done so much work, put so many different channels in place, so many different people in the right spots to have success. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's like one of the biggest, biggest things. And then mm -hmm. maybe the last one is just shipping cool shit, man. Filling cool stuff that people like that actually can use. And some of the stuff are going to be like game changers. We're going to be launching like a couple of big things like very soon this month. And just being on top of mind, not getting lazy, not getting complacent. A lot of people get, we're still like super motivated. We just had a team call before this about the new features, what to build, what do we still have the fire in us? And I feel if you're just doing it randomly, if you don't have the passion, it's not going to work out uh, as well. Yeah. I, wow. Okay. That that was that was valuable. Like I think what this all ties into really is because I guess why how can someone wake up every day and still have that fire? You kind of need like I don't think motivation is enough to cut it because you know we all m motivation comes and goes and I think this all ties to like how you have solved you you are solving a problem you had and so you know it inside out. Like something you said there was so i guess unconventional right that literally the the advice is to SaaS founders like build what your users want right listen to customer feedback and build exactly what they want and you've literally just said you didn't build a single feature requested it's all down to you guys and you know most people would say you're on a path to failure if if you do that but like you've just completely blown that out of the water and i like that and i think from working with you guys as well i've i just the general sentiment is you are a bit unconventional in like your approach you know just because other companies are doing it this way doesn't mean you guys have to do it that way i think that's something i've i've like really admired and you can see it like um in the in the features you've built like the signature you know every other company were like yeah sure but you're like well we don't think that's going to get people more revenue and so that's that's a north star metric um okay interesting so you guys have, uh, you know, it's fair to say, I'd say you're like trendsetters in like the cold email space. You know, since you guys have launched, there have been a few similar products come out. Um, you guys definitely introduced this unique mechanism of um, uh, like unlimited sending accounts, which I feel like still only a very small percent of the market are aware of. I feel like there's still so much more... Um, like penetration to happen there, like for people to become aware of this, like corporate teams and stuff like that. But um, what it's it's clear to say you guys are ahead, but like, what are you doing to stay ahead? And and how does that, how does that affect your decision-making process with these sort of similar products coming out, you know, people trying to take your market share? Um, like how, how does that um, affect your decisions? It used to affect us more. Uh, in a sense, so it's still like it's motivating for us. It makes us like puts a fire under our asses to get stuff out faster, especially for a developer. We're now using it as our developer motivation tactic. Every time a competitor launches something, we just send it to the Slack chat. And then he all oh, like, I'm, I'm going to build it. I'm going to add this like super quickly. Or oh, this weekend, I'm going to do it. Uh -huh. Like that, uh, <laughs> that's like how we view it. But we've now taken like a high level overview. And we got into the tunnel vision in the beginning. Uh, where we, if somebody that in the beginning copied us, built something new and was like super loud about it, or like we have to build it now. And we actually have built a couple of these things, but we got lo lost from the track, like our own, yeah. uh, the yeah. flow that you mentioned before, the North Star. Now we mm -hmm. have more clarity on that. And we're building stuff now, like big stuff that other people don't have, other people in a niche mm -hmm. don't have. We're building, in, building them in the instant way, super clean, super simple, still unlimited, mm -hmm couple of stuff like right now we're going to launch today tomorrow one big one big thing and then at the end of the month another one that are going to be game changers hopefully that's what we want to make them make them be and i think it just comes down to again that fire that like interest mm -hmm. like we think about it like why aren't other people building this other teams have like 30 20 developers why aren't they building this and i don't know like i honestly don't know maybe it comes down because they're not using it but there's, I think, one more after these two things that we're going to launch this month that we want to have like a huge, big thing. And then we want to like focus on those parts, making it as simple as possible because there's still like so much innovation to be had. Like email is not going anywhere. People are going to still use it. There's so much money to be made, so many 
more additions that are that work so well with cold email mm-hmm. like a lot of people are building like linkedin twitter automation stuff like that so there's like so many different ways where it can go we're mm-hmm. not in a loss of uh, any ideas but we stopped mm-hmm. focusing cost or uh, competitors that much and focusing on what we want to do what we see helps people make money interesting yeah well i mean this is just a uh, a baseless assumption but you could you could assume maybe like you guys are working towards this north star um because you kind of set the trend and you know a lot of these products are probably just following in your trail and so the new features you're launching they're launching but by the time they launch it they're what uh three six eight months behind um, and that's just a launch right you guys are probably already thinking like three four features ahead um but yeah definitely don't want to focus on your competitors especially if they're like not innovating as fast as you right because then it's just um you're not, you're, you're going to stop your growth um what do you because there's a lot happening um in the last few months with like uh cold email with like um warming up you know uh some it seems like the platforms like google and outlook etc like cracking down um what do you think the future for cold outreach looks like um, I think it's going to be in instantly like all this stuff that uh, are going to be like difficult with other providers. We're going to provide her. We, we're going to provide them as simple as easy as possible. So there's like mm. nothing to worry about pretty much like that's the goal and to make it as mm. simple as possible for users to use everything in one platform. So it's like one app, one platform goal is pretty much like what we're aiming for, what we feel is the future because right now it's like segmented bringing it mm. all into one place. I think that's, mm. that's future, like organic, simple, simple way. Nice. Okay, cool. Got it. Um, all right. So, I mean, you're what, 18 months, like two years into, into the SaaS founder journey now. Um, there seems to be, especially in like the money Twitter sphere, right? Uh, it's a very small bubble, you know, software has, well, SaaS has been around for uh, decades at this point, right? But it seems to be a bit of a gold rush at the moment uh, with these, I guess, young entrepreneurs who have perhaps started an agency. They've, um, you know, they've upgraded their lifestyle. They now have like a lot of cash coming in. So they're starting to look to software because it's a, a good asset. Right. But what are some misconceptions you think people have about starting a SaaS company? Because I don't think it's as easy as it's made out to be. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. So the main book I always recommend for people is called Peopleware which talks about uh, software. And so if you think about it, there are no like software problems in a software company. It's all people problems. It's still like a person have to go in and fix it until we have chat GPT uh, or like a co-pilot, whatever, like do this for us, but it's still managing people. And every problem we have, like if you're shipping slowly, it's not because of code or, uh, code or software, it's because your developers aren't working. Still need to manage mm-hmm. them. If you're having a lot of bugs or like downtime, it's not because again the code. It's because people aren't. You haven't put in uh, firewalls and stuff to stop that from happening. You don't have people mm-hmm. online to uh, prevent that. So it's a lot of people managing still putting people in the right places, like it is with any other uh, company. But once you get past that hurdle, then it gets like better. But then you have another. Uh, hurdle which is like the scalability from the tech mm-hmm. side plus the team because it's if people are used to service at business where you get two three clients every month now if you get 2,000 customers over a month how are you going to handle that uh, from the software database side and from the customer support side how are you going to offer support for them how are you going to make them not leave and there's so many other problems that's going to come into your life like dealing with churn uh, looking every like how can you make people stay longer why you should build, like we mentioned, like the competitors, everybody building your stuff. Now with the no code automation or like no code software builders, it's so easy. Like mm-hmm. you mentioned, the cold rush, there's going to be competitors mm-hmm. that can build pretty much what you're building. So you need to have some kind of advantage before you go into it. If you just think it's like cold rush, I'm going to go into it. You might make some mm-hmm. quick work and that's like fine for maybe like some people. But if you're talking about building a sustainable software, SaaS, it's much harder. You need to think about the team your co-founders, who you want to work with, customer support, being prepared on every every like avenue. And if you can do it, like then great. 
then go for software. Software is amazing. Yeah, got it. I think, yeah, the like just building the product, right? The MVP, like building the software is just literally step one, right? You need to ship new features. You need to then, if you want to scale that, that means bringing a team on board. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the same as any other business, right? All businesses have like, um, their difficulties, but yeah, I definitely don't think getting started in SaaS isn't a case of just spending 20, 30 K on an MVP and boom, like you've got your, you've got your 10 X multiple exit <laughs> on the books. It's, it's definitely not that easy. Um, okay. If you, let's say, um, I don't know, instantly got shut down tomorrow, you know, they, the, they'd had enough of instantly like, um, what business would you start? It could be a, it could be like a SaaS company, but you know, are there any other sort of verticals that you know interest you a bit or excite you? That's an interesting question. I would say I would take a break, man. I would just chill, go <laughs> go to a cabin uh, at Alaska and make music. Like that's what I would mm -hmm. do. But if I need, like you put, come to my head, I need to start a new business. I would, if I still have the same team, probably software. If I'm by myself. And if I can use my resources, maybe again, then software, like I have some ideas, but I probably wouldn't start an agency. I probably, I've been looking more into like investing, maybe like angel investing, mm -hmm. just helping other companies going in as consultants. Now I have like a lot of experience, both sides and raising money and building a bootstrap company. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I could be of use for some smaller, like a cool startups. And also I want to, the next business that I want to be into, like if I go in big, I want the KPI to be the North star, like saving lives. I saw a video wow. with Mark Grover's channel. They did like drones in Africa that uh, send blood and medicine, everything. And this is like their KPI is like saving human lives compared to MRR mm. return. So I want to do a little bit more. I don't know what you call it be like a philanthropist, like help people yeah, yeah. to something a little bit different angle, man. Wow. That was a very wholesome answer, right? You could have just said, yeah, man, I just spin up a new software. <laughs> yeah. I'll just scale to, you know, 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. No, I like it. I like it. Um, no, that's a, it's a wholesome answer. Okay. So last few questions. Um, what does the, what does the future look like for instantly? You know, how, how, how are you planning to, to take over the world? <laughs> yeah. So. I don't know when this uh, podcast is going to go live. We're going to launch two really big things month, two weeks. Mm -hmm. this month. So in May already, you're going to see what those things are. And then we only have one piece left to build a unified one called email outreach app. And we're going to see, we still feel like there's so much potential with instantly. Mm -hmm. uh, we have like gotten some offers or some investment offers and stuff. We're like dabbling in that, seeing like what's out there. We're also dabbling in seeing if we can acquire something that will be useful for us. So both sides mm -hmm. selling and buying, but mm -hmm. right now we still have our eye on the price. We have the motivation, not thinking about mm -hmm. like full exit or something like that, but at some point, probably maybe depend on like what goes on. But right now it's just like still focused on just being the best damn tool out there. All right. It's gone. Okay. Um, all right. So you, you recommended one, um, for, for like SAS specifically, I don't know if you're much of a reader, but what are like two books or, you know, three books? or just resources that you would um, recommend for people who, you know, might be in the SaaS space looking to level up or, you know, might be an entrepreneur looking to get into the SaaS space. Like what are some books or resources that have like really inspired and helped you? Yeah, so software specifically, Peopleware, that's amazing. And maybe for like mindset that you mentioned, we're doing things like unconventionally. I like the book mm -hmm. uh, Rework. I don't know the authors. I'm really bad like with the author names. And yes, then for maybe some like different angle is it's called some 40 tales of afterlife. I think it's really interesting short stories about potential, like what can happen uh, after we die just to like open up your mind, wow. think of different solutions. So like, I also like, like I can't read only nonfiction, like business book business, after another. Yeah. So I just like switch fiction, nonfiction, fiction, nonfiction. And yeah. I don't know if there's anything else like my resources, like I like audiobooks, I like podcasts a lot. And mm. what I felt I did wrong before, like also like raising money or networking, there's so much like random information out there. So like recommending random books for people that don't 
maybe have used for them is like random. Mm -hmm. There are so specific things for your niche, what you're struggling right now. If you want to start a software business, go listen to that software founders podcast, like listen to this podcast, uh, hit me up, like network with those people mm -hmm. that you need in that phase. If you want to learn sales, then go learn sales books, like sales books I can uh, recommend as well. So a couple of good ones that are written, Spiel. It was, what was it? Let me Google. I think it was like consultancy type selling. Uh, I can maybe send you later, you can add a link. I don't remember it, but it was mm -hmm. like really good. Like the structure of helping people, understanding them, if you can actually help them instead of like this pushy type, like stuck in down their throat. I really like mm -hmm. that one. And there's a very simple book, Words That Work, uh, for copywriting and just using it on sales calls, on your emails, just simply simplifying your language. Uh, mm -hmm. I forgot a lot of it, but I remember when I was at sales process, it worked close mm -hmm. a lot. Nice. Wow. Okay. Lots to go off there. I'm going to look into some of those. Um, send me the link of the sales uh, sales book. I'll definitely add that in. It'll be interesting. Okay. Um, so last two questions before we finish. Um, <laughs> bit of a random one, but I guess it um, lets us understand you on a personal level, uh, level. If you had to eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would that be? Sushi. Ah, interesting. We just Sushi we just man. talked about this with Rayo. I remember we we're talking like what what would be like the main one right now. I'm in my Asian food era. It's so good, man. I can eat it so much, and like I feel good after it. Like you know, I used to like pizzas and like all this like heavy stuff like pasta, but I always feel bad after it. I feel like a like a mm -hmm. column, bro. I just want to like mm -hmm. curl up and just be on a couch and want to do anything. If it's sushi, something mm -hmm. like, nice fresh, I'm ready to go. Nice, I like that. Okay, cool. All right. So, well, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, the only other like final question is where can people, you know, find out more about you instantly, stuff like that. Where can they find you? Yeah. So instantly.ai, you can try it for free, use it for free. And if you want to check out more of my stuff, Twitter, uh, my name, Raul Gaivand, I think I'm going to put the link down because the name is unorthodox, hard to, hard to pronounce. <laughs>